about uh, entanglement sampling, but I will actually spend most of my talk trying to convince you that you might want to sample entanglement <laughs> by talking a bit about randomness from a quantum system. So some, uh, uh, subs, uh, some of the things that I, I'm going to talk about is our subsets of some works uh, with Mario, with Frederic, and with Omar. So I guess the general question that uh, we need to kind of agree upon before we can embark on this talk is what do I mean when I say randomness? Okay. So I guess uh, I, can, I can go and toss this coin. And you all have some intuitive idea about what, what I mean when I say that uh, this is a random coin or it generates a random output. <coughs> so I guess usually you would say, okay, well, I want the coin to be 50-50. So the palm tree and the, and the 10 uh, appear with equal probability. But what you probably also mean when you're going to toss a coin with me, say we write a paper together, um, we are trying to decide who has to do the journal submission, is that not only is it 50-50, but I can also not predict better than 50-50 what is going to be the outcome of the coin. Because the coin might look 50-50 from you, but I'm perfectly correlated, so <laughs> I already know um, what's going to happen. Okay. So when I toss the coin, what we want is it's easiest to think about randomness by saying, okay, so we want to be 50-50. And we want this to be such that some observer cannot predict it with more than 50% probability. So in this talk, usually we will not just want to generate one coin as an output, but there will be some process, for example, me flipping the coin n times. And we want to generate, say, a bit string, b1 up to bn, um, which is random. So this here is the maximally mixed state, so maybe for classical people, this is just the quantum information way of writing the uniform distribution. And we want it to be uncorrelated, so in quantum information language, to be like a tensor product between some state that the observer may hold. So this is what we want to do. And so the question is how we're going to get there. And I want to give this a few different perspectives, given that, uh, I guess, you're interested in both computer science and physics. So I want to start with something that is actually, I guess, very familiar to people from computer science, namely some th a concept known as randomness extraction. Okay, so let me start with that. So unfortunately, I guess, um, we don't always have coins lying around. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not sure, maybe this for the palm tree side is also a bit heavier than the other side, who knows. So usually we don't already have coins which are 50-50, but we may have some kind of weaker source of randomness. So let me call this weaker source of randomness X. Maybe it's already also a little bit correlated. Okay. So maybe I don't know exactly what is this string X, but maybe I have some information about it. So maybe for also some people from quantum information who are familiar with quantum key distribution, so you might think, that this is some raw key that we're generating, and this is some information that the eavesdropper may have gathered about this raw key. And so then the question is kind of, how can we take this weak source of randomness and turn it into like a perfect source of randomness, some random bits k. Okay. So again, so we want the k and the reference is uniform and uncorrelated. And so the question is, how do we get there? And so Essentially, what the goal of a randomness extractor is, is to take this imperfect source of randomness and to turn it into a, well, hopefully good source of randomness. Okay. So sometimes I will use some notation. So what this means, this is just uh, a way of writing down a weak source of randomness. So this just means in quantum information language that this register X holds some classical string with some probability. And depending on the string, well, for example, some eavesdropper or some other entity may hold some information, rho e. Okay. So I guess I will, <laughs> computer scientists can switch off for this slide. I just want to kind of convince you with a simple example that it is in principle possible to move ourselves closer to a 50-50 coin than we initially started with. So let's for the moment forget about some kind of eavesdropper and say we just have some kind of classical probability distribution. I'll just write it like this over n bit strings, where I'll just assume that every bit is, say, 0 with probability 2 thirds and 1 with probability 1 thirds. 
So maybe just some weighted coin, it's IID, so every bit has the same probability. And so basically, like a classical randomness extractor, it's just some function that we're going to apply to this x. And well, whatever comes out here, we want it to be, well, close to 50-50. So one thing that we can do here, so let me give you an example of a function. We could just do this, say, three times. So the, this is like a three-bit string. I could XOR them all together. And to kind of check whether this is maybe closer to uniform, we now just want to compute the probability that, say, we get the zero outcome. And well, we can easily do that. So the probability that this is zero is just the probability um, that we have an even number of ones, so either none or two. And if we do this calculation, then we can see, well, we are now closer to 50-50 that we started with. Okay. Of course, I mean, there's a lot of things known about randomness extraction, but I hope I convinced you that in principle possible, we can make ourselves more random than we were in the beginning. Okay. So usually when people talk about randomness extractor, we don't actually know so much about the string x. So here the string x is also called the source. But usually we don't actually know, we don't have this luxury of knowing that every bit is like two-thirds zero and one-thirds one. But usually we just have some minimal guarantee, like an entropy. And if we forget about some E right now, then the entropy is really just determined by the highest peak in the probability distribution. So if you think about maybe adversarially trying to break the randomness extracted, then maybe this is a is useful measure. Because if I apply some function f to x, then this is the probability that um, we can guess the initial string x, and therefore, of course, also the outcome of this process. Now, I have some bad news, <laughs> namely that um, if we only know the entropy of x, then it's very easy to see, actually, that there is not a single deterministic function that gives us just a single bit of randomness. Okay, so what we just did before really only works because we have this IID guarantee. But here we're kind of doomed. However, it's possible, in fact, to <coughs> still, so to say, do randomness extraction if I have a little bit of perfect randomness to start with. Like you give me this for free, say a number of 50-50 coins, and I'm going to use them to say bootstrap, so to say, the generation of randomness. So concretely what this means is that I will not just apply one function f, but I'm going to choose <coughs> with my initial randomness, which is called the seed, some function from some set of possible functions, and I'm going to apply this to x to get my outcome k. So again, maybe for the people who are familiar with quantum key distribution, um, you could pick, so say, a function from a set of two universal hash functions, and then this would be the key. So maybe you're not protesting because you're saying, well, I put a little bit of randomness in, so it's not surprising that randomness comes out. Okay. Um, so ideally what one would want there is what computer scientists call a strong extractor, which means that the initial randomness R and the output are jointly uniform. Or actually you can also think that the output K should be uniform even given the initial randomness R. So maybe let me explain this in the picture. Um, so again, remember that it's useful to think about the generation of randomness as saying, how well can this guy predict the outcome of the process at the end? So you could think that in a strong extractor, what we want is that the output k here is uniform given E and R. So it means that if the observer initially holds E, but we're actually going to tell him which function we applied, so we tell him what r is, then nevertheless, everything that he has at the end, so e and r, we nevertheless want that this k here is uniform and uncorrelated, or at least close to that. Okay. So this is what people in computer science call a strong extractor, and basically, I hope I've addressed your protest that um, we've really kind of, so to say, intuitively made more randomness or new randomness than we started with. So we cannot just simply output the initial seed, <coughs> but we really have to do something non-trivial. Yes? Um, so uh, I mean, once the observer, the <coughs> observer know the, the seed, 
already? Okay, so, so, so that's a good question. So the important part is that kind of he has gathered this information E before we are going to do this extraction process. So if you think about, I don't know whether you're familiar with quantum key distribution. Um, so there, Alice and Bob talk for f back and forth over some classical and quantum uh, channel. At the end of this, the adversary has gathered some information E. And Alice and Bob now share what here is called the raw key X. And their goal is to turn this raw key into kind of a perfect key that is uniform and uncorrelated from the eavesdropper. So there, kind of, it's important that the choice of function is kind of made after the eavesdropper has already gathered E. So you can think that this is fixed. He has some memory device. It stores all of this. Now Alice is going to pick a function using this random seed. And only afterwards, so to say, we give this inf initial information R to the eavesdropper. So it's important, like it would be deterministic, so to say, if he knew that already ahead of time. So say at the beginning of the protocol, Alice would announce, okay, so somewhere later on, I'm going to apply this function um, f of r. And he could basically uh, target his entire, so to say, attack, um, knowing already what r is going to be. So it's important that we only do this at the end. Does e come from classical measurements or quantum measurements? Uh -huh, so um, here, it actually, everywhere in my talk, e is a can be a quantum register, so it's just some quantum memory device, arbitrarily large. <coughs> okay, are there more questions about this? Okay. Okay. So let's think again about how well this can work. Okay. And when I say how well this can work, I mean, let's say that our goal is to maximize the number of random bits that we create. Then the question is, how many random bits can we make up to some accuracy? So in the previous slide, I had said we want this state to be close to being uniform and uncorrelated. And what I mean by close here is that like we are close in the L1 norm, the trace norm, uh, up to some epsilon. We should think of epsilon as being small. So I said before that you can kind of think if E was not there, that the min entropy is just related to how well we can guess X. And it turns out that even if E is a, a fully quantum register, then, then the min entropy is just minus the log of the probability of guessing X. So quantumly what this means is that E is a quantum register. I can make any measurement that I want on E, and my goal is to produce an estimate of X. So it can be shown um, that the maximum output length that can be produced, so L here is the number of bits that come out, is in fact exactly determined by the magnitude of this entropy. And of course, there's also some fudge terms related to how good we want the approximation to be. Yes. When you say output length, you mean the number of output random bits? Yes. So this is well studied in classical computer science. There's a beautiful survey, actually, uh, if you want to know more about this. Okay. So I don't want to talk about this, actually. But I want to now ask a different question, namely that what is actually a weak randomness source? Okay, say we want to generate some randomness, and um, we may have some string x lying around. But if you think about it physically, then I guess you could think that x is actually the result of some underlying measurement on some quantum system, which I'll call A. So there's some initial measurement that takes us from A to X. And kind of using a classical randomness extractor, we wanted basically to um, obtain some random bit from this outcome X. But if you think about it this way, then it's actually quite a natural um, question to ask, is whether all measurements are equally good, so to say, at producing uh, randomness <coughs> from, from A. Or maybe if we would go directly back to A, can I kind of find measurements which are kind of very good at producing randomness directly from A? rather than just relying on some measurement that first gives me x and then doing some classical post-processing. So this is kind of the motivation for what we call quantum to classical randomness extractors, where we don't start with a classical string, but we now start with some kind of quantum system A. And we are trying to get randomness from the system A. Kay. 
So I would like to emphasize that just like in the classical case, we will want to do this with kind of a minimal guarantee of the source. So the source here now being the quantum system A. Namely, we want to make some statement about how much randomness comes out by purely using some information measure, so to say, of A, uh, without actually knowing the details of, of, of the state. Okay. So I will say shortly what information measure, in fact, will be relevant. Okay. So let me just emphasize what this kind of looks like. So you can think that all I've done here is I've replaced X with some quantum system A. And instead of uh, applying some function to it, we're going to apply a measurement, possibly using, again, some randomness, some seed R. And so you could think that like, uh, what such a measurement looks like um, is that we're going to apply some unitary um, indexed by the seed A, uh, R. Possibly then we're going to measure in the standard basis and possibly we're going to discard some of the output bits to obtain So maybe I want to emphasize a few things here. So basically what we're doing here is we're doing a projective measurement, uh, which is somewhat important in the setting, um, because if you use uh, some kind of POVM, you could actually introduce randomness over the ancilla, but we really just want to get randomness only from A. And I will explain a bit later why this is important. Okay. So here, of course, we don't start with something that is classical, so we just have some arbitrary state rho AE but kind of the output guarantee that I want looks exactly the same. Then we want to be uniform on K and uncorrelated from E and the choice of measurement R. <coughs> okay. So let's think again about how, when will this work in the sense like, so to say, when can I at all hope to kind of produce some random bits K here? And I want to actually think about this by thinking about when it cannot work. Okay. So let's say that this state rho AE that they share in the beginning is actually the maximally entangled state between A and E. Okay. So this here is the maximally entangled state, this here is held by A, this here is held by E. So let's imagine that we're going to apply this procedure, we're going to do a measurement where depending on R I'm going to apply unitary, I'm going to measure I'm going to get some longer string k and k prime, and possibly I'm going to discard some of it to obtain k. So again, let's think about randomness as <laughs> something being random if it's hard to predict. So if we want to show that, say, when it cannot work, when randomness cannot be generated, our task is now to find a strategy for E to perfectly predict what is the outcome of this process. So it's kind of clear that we can do this here, Namely, if I have the maximally entangled state, you apply some unitary to the state. You tell me what that unitary is. Well, I can just do exactly the same thing to my system. And sure, because the maximally, correlated state, maximally entangled state is maximally correlated at any basis, well, I can just measure my system E now to get also K and K prime. And sure enough, um, well, I can get the outcome. Okay. So somehow when this works, like when we can, when some randomness can come out, so to say, matters on how much entanglement there is between A and E. So in this worst case, they're maximally entangled, there's no hope. But maybe if we are not so entangled, um, we can get some randomness out. Okay. So the question is kind of what is the right quantity um, that quantifies um, our ability to produce some random K. And it turns out that this is indeed, again, just the Yes. Ah, so I, I wanted to give you an example of a state. Oops. I wanted to give you an example of some state rho AE, such that one cannot produce a single random bit in the sense that it is uniform and in particular uncorrelated from E and R. So the goal here is to say let's consider the maximally entangled state. So if I apply some projective measurement, well, I'm going to apply some unitary. I'm going to measure and get some outcome. But in this case, if E knows which unitary I've applied, and the maximally entangled state is maximally correlated at any basis, which means that if E applies U and measures, in fact, it gets the same outcome 
that was over here. So this means that, well, sure, k may be, so to say, random, but it is certainly not uncorrelated from E, because, in fact, E can perfectly, pr he knows exactly what this k is going to be. Okay. Is that clear? Okay. You don't claim that in time you Sure, yeah, so I mean, of course I could. Uh, no, no, actually I'm saying that entanglement is a bad thing. It's, <laughs> it's the worst, yes. Yeah, sure, of course, yeah. I'm just, I'm just trying to give you an example of kind of the worst case scenario in this quantum sense. Yes, of course, indeed. <laughs> so I'm just giving you the worst case scenario, so to say. And I now want to tell you what is actually the quantity that determines how much randomness can come out there. And in fact, it's a quantity that is, in fact, you can intuitively think about how far we are re away from the scenario of being maximally entangled. So this quantum min entropy is uh, defined as the following. So the, the log goes over all of this. So this here is the maximally entangled state between A and the copy of it, A prime. And we're now going to look at how close can we get this state rho AE to the maximally entangled state in terms of the fidelity by performing an operation on E. So I allow you to do some of the best operation possible on E to get yourself as close as possible to this maximally entangled state. So you could think that this is quite similar to the classical setting where this quantity is determined by your probabil probability of guessing A. You want to get yourself as close as possible to being classically maximally correlated. Here, you want to get yourself as close as possible to being quantumly maximally correlated with the system A. So this is kind of intuitively what this quantity means. And just like in the classical case, um, one can see um, that this quantity determines how much randomness can come out. Um, so in particular, like if A and E are entangled, this here determines how many random bits can be generated. So maybe I would like to make one important remark here, namely that you're probably familiar with the classical min entropy, which is always positive. So it's important to realize that this quantity here, the quantum quantity, when A and E are entangled, can in fact be negative. So for example, let's take our example from before, where this was already the maximal entangled state. Then I don't need to do anything. This quantum fidelity has the property that it's one, if the state is the same. So then we just have minus the log dimension of A. So this means that, in fact, no randomness at all comes out of this process. Okay. Okay. So this kind of quantifies, so to say, if I go somewhat away from this scenario of being maximally entangled, I can now try, start generating some randomness. And how much depends exactly, so to say, how far one is away from this maximally entangled scenario. So we prove a few things about this, actually. <laughs> this is not the main topic of my talk. Um, namely, we prove that this is can be attained. So there exist some measurements that do that. And um, we prove some upper and lower bounds on the amount of randomness that is initially required. Our upper bounds are quite good in the sense that, in fact, we can attain them um, approximately. But our lower bounds are actually pretty bad. So there's a lot of room for improvement. We also show some constructions of what we call bitwise quantum to classical extractors. These are just easy to kind of implement uh, and are useful for some quantum crypto protocol. Okay. So I would like to maybe say why you would want to do anything like this, apart from the fact that, of course, maybe it's nice to generate randomness from a quantum system. <laughs> so the way we actually use this in some protocols, which I'm not going to talk about here, is that we actually use them in a setting where we cannot perform this kind of standard classical to classical randomness extraction. So in quantum key distribution, um, actually one does use kind of classical randomness extraction, privacy amplification. And Alice and Bob, who want to generate a key, they trust each other. They can check on what the eavesdropper has done. And they can make an estimate of the min entropy about the classical string x, given the eavesdropper's information e. So in some two-party protocols that we studied, so there's just two parties, no Easter, but they don't trust each other. They don't have anybody to help them to make such an estimate. There are nevertheless various physical limitations. <coughs> For example, uh, some noisy storage device, but many other assumptions are possible. 
that actually impose a limit on how entangled A is with some potential adversary E. And so because we cannot estimate this, we cannot use this classical to classical extraction, but since we can, physical assumptions kind of give us a bound on this, we can then use these quantum to classical extractors in this scenario. Okay. So maybe I just want to make one more remark. So classically one always says that I cannot make any new randomness, not the same, that randomness can always only be generated if we have a setting where I basically have some classical string about which we have some kind of ignorance, and so to say the lack of, I guess, knowledge can be converted into something that kind of looks random. Quantumly, of course, you may be saying, well, I can make randomness. I know how to do it. I'm going to prepare a sigma z eigenstate. I'm going to measure it in the sigma x eigenbasis. And sure enough, because these two bases are complementary, the outcome looks random. So this is, of course, possible. But note that this works because you can prepare a particular state <coughs> that is in particular uncorrelated from the environment. So you could think that maybe these two scenarios are not so different actually, and that kind of the upshot of it is that randomness kind of classically as well as quantumly can be generated if the correlations with the environment are low. So it's just that in the classical scenario where I start with a classical string, it's sufficient for me that the classical correlations with the environment are low. And in the quantum case, well, I can produce something that is random if the quantum correlations with the environment are low. Okay. I guess. Um, sure, okay. So now the question is kind of, how can I ensure that quantum correlations are low? And there are some nice properties like the monogamy of entanglement that in particular, for example, can lead to some tests where I can convince myself that quantum correlations to the environment are low. So there are of course some nice things that one can kind of sort of say test for these quantum correlations that is not possible classically. So let me of course emphasize this. correlated state with environment, whatever, then you measure sigma x. You will finish with your correlation. No, no correlation anymore. Well, so note that what we kind of want here is that, uh, like, remember that I talked about the strong extractor sense, in the sense that I'm not kind of hiding anything from the environment. So you could think that in this case, the environment knows everything that you're going to do, or at least later learns everything that you're going to do. Um, and, and in this sense, like for example, say that if I'm maximally entangled with you, you're going to measure sigma x. Okay, late then I learn, oh, he measured sigma x. Well, I'm also going to measure sigma x. And sure enough, we are perfectly correlated. So the outcome is random, but nevertheless, I can predict it perfectly. Sigma X and yeah. then you measure sigma Z. Now the environment doesn't know anything. Sure, indeed in this case, like of course there are there are very many things that one can do to say destroy quantum correlations or test for quantum correlations by using the monogamy of entanglement. So I'm not saying that quantumly one cannot generate randomness, not at all. I'm just saying that kind of if one wants to understand what do I need to do in order to kind of generate randomness from the quantum system, I want to be sure that quantum correlations with the environment are low. So maybe I need to do some testing for it using monogamy of entanglement. Maybe I need to do some repeated measurement procedures. Um, I mean, that's all I'm saying. Okay. Maybe to make a remark here that uh, for these applications that we use them for here, these m repeated measurements are not useful because we kind of want <laughs> to have a few more properties than just this, this property here. Okay. okay. So let me now attempt to... Um, further motivate actually an extension, so to say, of, uh, I guess, quantum to classical extraction. You could think about them as fully quantum to quantum extraction. And I will make an attempt to motivate this from a more physical perspective, um, from uh, the perspective of thermalization. So usually in thermalization you start by considering I have some system A, there's some process, and well, in the end, I'm kind of interested. Um, does my the state on some system look thermal, for example. So for example, I guess a classic example is where I have some interactions with some environment, and in the end of the day, I want to know what does B look like. So one thing that I'm going to, uh, I, let me restrict to some particular example, namely, let's just ask the question, what happens for almost all interactions with the environment? 
So you should now be thinking of A as actually comprised of some system and some environment. We're going to just pick a unitary at random and throw away part of the system to get the outcome B. And so the question is, what does my outcome look like? So you can think about this also with respect to a reference um, in something known as relative thermalization, um, which I'm not going to talk about here. And here, again, the goal is to make a statement about what is the outcome of the state here. For example, is it a thermal state? But we also want that we are uncorrelated from the environment. So there's various physical reasons why you might want to have this, but that's maybe too much for this talk. So in this vein, one can think about, um, say, quantum-to-quantum -quantum extraction, which actually has a name in quantum information theory under the name of the decoupling theorems. Um, so this was originally introduced in the context of information theory. There's also some more recent results, which are more general. So the idea here, I guess you're getting familiar to this picture, is that we start with some quantum system A. We're going to possibly apply some unitary to it, say choice of unitary, followed by some map. So, for example, what I had just before is that A is a system in the environment and we're going to trace out the environment to get B. And then the question is, is the state that we're ending up with uncorrelated from E and R and possibly independent of A? So, for simplicity in this talk, I want you to think about the state as just being the maximally mixed state. Okay? So, I'm not going to be... If I say thermalization, I'm not going to be concerned here with the question of does the system equilibrate, is this really a thermal state, I'm only interested in is it independent of the initial state, so let's just think about it as the maximally mixed state for the purpose of this talk. So you can already see the anal energy of this, okay, so like um, we're basically doing exactly the same thing, only here we're just basically producing a quantum system. So I guess to give some overview of this, so I talked about this classical to classical extraction, I talked about this quantum to classical extraction, I talked about this quantum to quantum extraction, and I guess they're related in one direction, namely that of course if I were have make this the maximum limit state, I measure it, I get something that's random. I mean, I, this also works if this would be a classical system, but the other way actually, we're not so sure. So let me say, spend a few more minutes saying something about these quantum-to-quantum -quantum extractors, and then I'll actually talk a little bit about entanglement sampling, because then I hope by that time I convinced you why you might want to do that. Uh, yes? Uh, did you already answer to the previous question from the previous slide what happens for generic field? You addressed the question? Yes, I will say that actually in a moment. Oh. <laughs> um, so I will give you an example actually of such a decoupling theorem in a moment. But let me just say what they generally look like. So starting with the state rho AE, we're going to apply some unitary index by R to the A system, followed by some map. Okay, so here the map, I've written it as going from some A, and the output is called B. So I'm calling it B because remember that it's not classical, it's just random. It's just quantum. So here, this is just some measure over the set of unitaries. And we want to have some approximation guarantee in terms of epsilon. So I just want to kind of convince yourself that um, such uh, decoupling theorems have uh, found <laughs> applications so to some... So I will give you in a, in a moment an example of such a particular map where in fact it is known that, for example, for the Haar measure over unitaries, tau will be the maximally mixed state. But in general, in fact, tau will depend on this map but I'm not going to talk about this here. So one can use and abuse this decoupling theorem to say some interesting things. <laughs> For example, um, maybe you're uh, uh, familiar with this result by Short, Popesco, and Winter that basically says that for all states of the system in the bath, the state of the system is close to maximally mixed, or in fact, you can also take it to be thermal. And this is kind of one can obtain this easily also from, from such a decoupling theorem. So it has applications also in quantum information theory. And basically for all these applications, one makes particular choices of this map uh, tau here and the systems A and E. 
So in quantum information theory, and that's maybe important also if you're interested in these motivations, one can use them to derive actually schemes that kind of recover entanglement from some noisy process, <laughs> where this unitary U actually will correspond to an encoding scheme. One can also abuse it in all kinds of other settings. For example, one can use it to um, actually show that one can gain work by erasing some system. Um, and well, it's also been used to study kind of information loss in black holes, but Patrick is here, so he can tell you much more about this. Okay. So I just want to convince you actually here that kind of quantum to quantum extractors, or like this decoupling theorem, has rather wide um, uh, applications in quantum information theory. So we kind of want to know more about this. So the particular example for which I will give some parameters in a moment is the partial trace. So you can think that actually A is A qubits, A1 up to AN. And I'm going to throw away all but R of these qubits. So again, note that we have no chance that this works if A and E are maximally entangled. Okay. Again, sure, maybe the output would look random. But again, because the maximally entangled state is correlated in any basis, um, I can basically just undo the unitary on my system E. And sure enough, you can never uh, get yourself to be uncorrelated. From So I'm not going to say it again, but the upshot of this part will also be <laughs> that in fact also for the decoupling theorem, kind of how well one can decouple themselves, of course depends a bit on the map that I'm going to do here, but it also depends on the initial correlations. And in fact, if we fix the partial trace, then kind of the amount of um, uh, bits R that can be uncorrelated here really depends exactly on the uh, mean entropy again. So. Let me just give an example. Actually, we don't know so many decoupling theorems. For example, for the partial trace, one gets some approximation that looks like this, just to give you some feeling for this. However, kind of the set of unitaries for which one presently has such decoupling theorems, we don't know much about them. So we know that it's possible for the Haar measure, also for two designs, approximate two designs. <coughs> and more recently, actually, there's some beautiful results uh, that have some unitaries which are in more efficient in this sense. So the question is kind of, how could we hope to find such unitaries, which have these? Huh? Ah, so the question is kind of, from which set do I have to draw these unitaries? And this basically says that there are, there are sets of unitaries, which correspond to kind of circuits, quantum circuits, of polylog n bit depth, where n is the number of qubits, and from which I can sample one at random. And then I will have such a decoupling type theorem with some other epsilon here, though, than this one. But yeah, so one can uh, create approximate designs, um, uh, which are also pretty good. But um, I mean, I can tell you more about this later, because I think otherwise I will not get to my entanglement sampling part. <laughs> okay. So the question is kind of which unitaries have this decoupling property? So I hope I convinced you now that the min entropy is kind of important. So the min entropy dictates kind of the number of random bits. The min entropy also dictates kind of the number of qubits that can come out here. Um, so I've also already told you that the min entropy um, uh, is related to entanglement. So I want to tell you now what is entanglement sampling. And I want to motivate this by the following question. Namely, could we perform extraction, actually any type of extraction, quantum classical, quantum quantum, by touching only very few of these qubits? Okay. So, well, one natural approach uh, is to say, well, let's pick a few qubits at random, like these red ones here. So I'm going to pick a subset of these qubits. And then I'm going to apply my favorite decoupling strategy after that. Okay. So basically, I have two kinds of amounts of randomness that I'm going to invest here, namely this subset S and the set R of unitaries that I'm going to pick. Okay. And so I hope I convinced you that kind of the min entropy <laughs> is kind of the important part that dictates whether this part is going to work. So basically, if we want to say, how well does this, so to say, sample and then decouple procedure here works, it will work, well, if we can say something about the min entropy, about that E has about the subset AS. And so our goal is, so I start with some initial entropy 
of a given e. And the question is now, can we say something about the min entropy of the subset? And we're going to phrase this in such a way that I'm going to be interested in, so to say, the min entropy per qubit. So if these here are n qubits, so you can think that this here is the min entropy per qubit. So I want to relate it, I want to make a statement about the min entropy on the subset in terms of some rate function f involving the original min entropy rate per qubit and the number of qubits that I'm going to be left with. So I should say there are some results known if A is actually classical and E is also classical. Okay, so these are some results by Niesen and Zuckerman, already um, somewhat uh, older. There's some more recent results by Vardan. Uh, there's also some results known if A is classical and, ah, actually I apologize, I called uh, E here R as the reference. I haven't changed all my slides around. Um, where A is classical and, in fact, the reference R or E is quantum. However, we only know something there previously whether when A is uniform, if we sample blocks but not bits. And there are some weak results known that apply when we sample bits. And I don't want to show you the proof, actually, in this talk, but I want to give you a plot to give you some idea about how this rate function behaves. So I'm phrasing it here actually in terms of the two entropy to get some kind of exact statement, but you could think that this is equivalent to the mean entropy up to some small fudge factor. <coughs> so what does this rate function look like? So I'm interested in the rate per bit. So it looks somewhat ugly, but um, this is why I'm plotting it for you. Okay. So this here is the mean entropy. Okay. Actually here the true entropy. Um, per bit. This here is the rate function. And so the blue line here is the result <laughs> that we have for A is quantum and E is quantum. So there's nothing to compare this to because there's no previous results that do this fully quantum uh, sampling. Let's say that A is classical. Kay? So then we can compare to some previous results. So here this purple line is some results that apply for um, uh, these are results by Jörg Bullschläger um, for sampling classical bits. This here is kind of our mean and B rate, so to say, if A is actually classical, if you already know, you guarantee me that A is classical. And there's some other lines here where we can get some better bounds for certain restricted classes of states. Okay. Sorry, I, mm -hmm. I, I lost you. Where, is, where are the small number of bits? In the previous slide? Ah, so, yes, yeah, so my apologies, I, there, there's a lot missing here. So, like, the point is that what we want, oops, where is it? So, this is the number of bits that I'm left with, and I want to now have some conversion, so to say. I want to know, so this is my original min entropy per bit or per qubit, and I want to know what is the kind of rate conversion between the min entropy per bit of the original setting to the resulting setting. So, basically, this here is some number, and it tells you that in the end I have this number times bits and you just of minus b. Yes. So I would like to emphasize here that here we choose them fully randomly, which of course is not efficient if you think about this motivation of maximizing minima <laughs> the seed size. But for now we just choose them randomly, um, fully randomly. Okay. Well, so this is what we show. Okay, so this is our entanglement result uh, put in graphics. Um, and in particular, if you're just interested in this decoupling regime, we can you can now use it to say something about few qubit decouplers. Namely, we're going to sample, then we're going to apply some arbitrary decoupler on the resulting qubits, and well, you get some epsilon, which is just obtained by um, bounding this using this rate function. Do you have more questions? Yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying to estimate how good the results. So, um, yeah, so what would we expect versus what you got? Um, well, 
note that kind of the fact that you can get kind of better bounds for some classes of states probably means that for some classes of states one can certainly say something better. I would think that if you don't know anything at all and you just know the mean entropy, then we're actually not too far from optimal. But, but we don't know. Um, well, so note that the, the, like, you might think that, oh, because like maybe when I become positive, I kind of always know that I'm not entangled, for example. But this is actually not the case. So one sees that kind of the mean entropy of A given E is always possible, positive if the state is separable, but the converse is not true. Um, so like, if I promise you really that, in fact, here we promise even more, we know that we promise that A is also, also classical, actually. Um, then one can actually get a much better bound. Why this here does not go to the origin by itself, I think it's really just because you don't know too much, because there are entangled states, for example, for which this, this entropy is also positive. So this is the regime where the ent initial entropy is positive. This is the, ini the regime where the initial entropy is negative. Um, but yeah, I can only give you this intuition. <laughs> I actually do suspect, though, there is the same intermediate regime in the sense that our result is probably somewhat optimal down here and up there. But there's probably some room for improvement in this quadrant. Okay. Well, of course, we can now apply it because I hope I convinced you. We want to know the min entropy. Now we can bound the min entropy. So then we can do few qubit decoupling. So I want to actually, in the last few minutes that I have left, just say something about that. We can actually show something much more general, which I have not talked about. Namely, if I start with the min entropy, so entanglement using the min entropy, then just sampling is just one of process that could affect the system A. So I would like to say that we actually have a much more general theorem that kind of relates the entropy of, of A given E to the entropy of some process being applied to A and the reference E. Okay. So I will briefly state the theorem. Um, I, can, I, can, I guess I'm out of time, so I don't want to explain too much about it. Um, basically, our theorem applies for kind of a natural classes of maps. And instead of maybe explaining this general theorem, I will give you another example of a map for which actually our general theorem kind of gives you a useful relation between these two min entropies. So another one is actually the, uh, a setting that from people from uh, quantum crypto are quite familiar with. Namely, I have n qubits, and I will measure each of them in random BB84 bases. So this is some process that is being applied to, to A. And in fact, we can also use our more general theorem to relate the entropy, so to say, again, per qubit of the original, to the entropy of the measurement outcome. So x here is the classical string of length n obtained by measuring each qubit in a random BB84 basis, where theta here indexes the basis. And so again, this here is just some rate function that converts the, 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 the previous entropy per bit into the new entropy, the resulting bit. So note that here, the number of bits does not change. Like we start with n qubits, we end with n classical bits, but there's some rate conversion function that relates the two. So we can use this for some cryptographic settings. For example, we can now show that you can, for example, implement bit commitment securely um, if in a protocol uh, in which the adversary loses just a log n, uh, roughly log n, of the transmitted signals, where n is the number of signals that we send. Okay. Okay. So there it has some other applications in quantum information theory. We can also use this to prove some bounds on fully quantum random access encodings. And more recently, actually, it has been uh, used by one of my courses in Vinton Brown to show um, decoupling unitaries of even smaller circuit depths. And this is kind of interesting because I, s I guess, well, not only do we kind of want to know what do such unitaries you look like, but they're also useful to give encoding schemes, for example. Um, so this is very nice. I would like to say for the experts that, of course, you can translate this into bounds on other entropic measures, if you care. Uh, yes. So let me summarize. 
Um, so basically, what we've shown here is actually a much more general statement that relates the original mean entropy, or the original, so to say, entanglement between A and E, to a mean entropy where we process A by some process. For example, we pick random qubits from A, and I'm asking how entangled is the system A with the sample of qubits that I've just taken. But I guess I, I convince you that there are also other uh, processes um, <coughs> which can happen to A, and then we want to know what is E's knowledge about A. Indeed, so entanglement can be sampled. Um, we can relate the entanglement of the sampling to the original amount of entanglement, and we can use this to obtain, so to say, local decouplers. So local here, not meaning local interactions, but local few qubits. I guess the question is whether there's other applications of entanglement sampling. Like I said, I, I already showed you that, in fact, it was already used to construct kind of new unitaries um, to, to decoupling. And it's also kind of interesting to ask what happens for this more general statement, because like I said, we have some general statement relating the original entanglement to the processed entanglement. And in general, I mean, even maybe not using this, I think it's quite an interesting um, question to come up with, so to say, sets of unitaries which are decoupling. So you could think of these as being kind of the analog of kind of classical functions that are good for randomness extractions. The question is here kind of which kind of unitaries have these properties. And well, like I said, this has some uh, um, uh, applications, not just the error correcting in codes, but also to understand, so to say, which processes, for example, could thermalize in some particular time, if you can say something about the structure of this decoupling operation. OK, thank you. Well, it's the same which I was concerned before. In your case, you have a quantum system. You can allow unitaries. You, you allow projective measurements. And you want to extract uh, randomness. Now, uh, if you allow projective measurement, just make two sequ sequential projective measurements. You get randomness. You don't need all this mathematics. You, you have a good answer that if you have a situation that you have Alice and Bob and Eve, then uh, if and you want uh, that Alice and Bob will have some randomness, then it's a secret randomness between Alice and Bob given if. Mm. But this sounds to me probably a different question. I'm not sure that all this analysis will, will work for, uh, for this kind of question. Well, so, so um, with this kind of question, you mean like the general question? No, or but, but if you have Alice and Bob and you want that they will have a secret random correlated uh, string, Mm -hmm. And then you have if. Th this is non trivial question. Because if you have if you have quantum system and you have projective measurement, you can generate randomness. You don't uh, you don't care about even anything, even if you knew everything, just make two sequential uh, projective measurements and you get completely random uh, yeah. random bit. So let me maybe emphasize like if you want to generate kind of randomness in some kind of cryptographic scenario, of course, like also in these two party settings, say where I want to commit a bit. I mean, the scenario is, I mean, as you say, like if I were to apply your procedure, I'm basically generating randomness that is completely uncorrelated from also all the rest of the protocol. So this is typically not what one wants when one wants to get a key from a raw key or when one wants to use this quantum classical extraction in these other protocols I haven't talked about. Because we want that the randomness that comes out, so to say, still has something to do with the original execution of the protocol. I mean, for example, it's not surprising that that in, in QKD, Alice can locally generate something and a key that is unknown to Eve. The challenge there is to generate a key that is unknown to Eve but <coughs> known to Bob. So exactly. The question is, is this general procedure directly applicable to this kind of question? Yes. So I said, so we have these special kinds also, these bitwise quantum to classical extractors. And we can actually show that there is some kind of class of two-party protocols. So any bitwise quantum to classical extractor gives some protocol to solve a particular task. But I haven't talked about this at all, actually. Um. So, so he was asking if, if all that you have shown actually can be borrowed to sort of maintain correlations with, with uh, another party that uh, you don't want to destroy the correlations with. You mean I am interested in preserving the correlations? Or with Bob. Hmm? With Bob. With Bob. 
yeah, you want you want E not to be able to predict the correlation, the the bit, the random yeah. bit, but you still want some particular system to maintain correlation, to be correlated, and you don't want to destroy this correlation. Um, yeah, so like we don't make a statement about this here at all. We just show that, for example, these bitwise classical quantum to classical extractors can be used to actually solve bit commitment or, 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 or do other kinds of tasks. So we don't make a statement, a general statement, about correlations involving a third party. Yeah. But then that's not clear why it's useful. No, I, think, I think it's useful for Wait. the purpose of understanding of domains. So this critique applies also for the classical, uh, also in classical computer science, when you have try to extract randomness from weak sources. It doesn't address a practical problem in computation, but it addresses the more general question of understanding the randomness as a computational resource and the more general aspect. So, so this is the way to look at it. Uh, can I comment on that? Uh, I think that uh, the way to I think that there are good motivations in the practical sense because, for example, if you assume a classical system, it's not that easy to, to uh, come up with randomness. And if you assume projective measurement, it is uh, easy. And even more, uh, uh, if you assume uh, that you have the, the, the uh, uh, source is really random, truly random, and you know, uh, but, but the adversary knows a little bit of the, of the bits, you know that he can, ha can know at most. Uh, K bits out of the, uh, and you know them perfectly. This is a, uh, I don't know, this is a reasonable uh, assumption, and uh, then you you could apply uh, uh, randomness extractors to to uh, recover the, the randomness. And here I I I, I don't see a uh, an, uh, a situation uh, easy to come up with where this is uh, um, I don't know helpful. Uh, But, but as, uh, as they said, uh, he th in quantum key distribution, you need Bob to to maintain his. Uh, uh, you want Bob to maintain the, the correlation. Here, you destroy all the correlations. No. So I mean, so like with respect to kind of some adversary system, we here just called E. Maybe it's held by Eve. Maybe it's some subsystem held by some adversary in some two-party setting. Actually, this is the way we use it here. One, cor one deliberately destroys correlations with that particular system here, E. This says nothing about correlations between E, A, and some other system. Define A as both uh, our system together. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so I guess I guess maybe you could bunch A and B together, but actually, I mean, uh, so I would like to emphasize that, like, the point is the point, like, what motivated for us is actually not QKD, because in QKD you have this luxury that Alice and Bob do trust each other and they can check on Eve, so they can make an estimate actually of the mean entropy about the classical string X. We kind of apply this in cryptographic situations where we don't have anybody to help us do this checking, um, namely we have two parties. Alice does not trust Bob, Bob does not trust Alice. So I don't have anybody to help me and <laughs> to make such a check. But there are various kind of physical assumptions, for example, the assumption that he has bounded memory or, or some other assumptions, that do limit the quantum min entropy A of E. And this is kind of the setting where, 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 where we apply this quantum to classical extract. Okay, I guess we'll continue during the break. Uh, and we'll continue at...